Hello again, Pat Hennen with the Shelter Institute, that wonderful school in Maine that teaches people how to be competent and confident about building homes, farming, dealing with the mechanical equipment. Today, I'm going to talk about chainsaws. I'm actually a, a lawyer. I'm a founder of a, I'm a group of founders of the local hospital, chairman of planning board, blah, 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 all kinds of things. Why in the world am I talking about a chainsaw? I should be doing much more important things. Well, <clears throat> this chainsaw is near and dear to me because in 1962, I was accepted to a college that was extremely expensive, Tufts University, and I had no money. My parents figured out that if I went to Idaho <clears throat> and cut a couple hundred trees every day for four months, I would earn tuition, room, and board. <laughs> So they put me on a Greyhound bus and off I went to uh, Idaho. It took a couple days to get out there by Greyhound in those days. And when I got there, I got to the major town, which consisted of one building. And it said on the post office, bar and hotel. <laughs> the one building was all of those and there wasn't a building for miles. And a gentleman from the uh, United States Department of Agriculture met me there. He also turned out to be the chainsaw dealer there. <laughs> and he took me to his uh, <clears throat> home where he had his dealership and uh, had me buy this saw with a five foot bar. And then we got into his beat up old uh, Jeep and headed off into the Targhee National Forest. And we went for what seemed like miles <clears throat> just through the woods. There were no roads, nothing. He knew the, the forest well, and finally we got to a place where there were some ribbons. And he says, this is your plot. It's a mile long and three quarters of a mile wide, and you have to cut everything down <clears throat> on, in this uh, uh, lot. Bye. <laughs> uh, there was a little more to it. Uh, he had a 50-gallon drum of gasoline that we took off and a 20-gallon drum of 90-weight oil and uh, <clears throat> another small drum of 30-weight oil. And I had a couple of cases of beans with pork. And, uh, and, he, and he took off. That was it. In Idaho at that time, you had to cut alone because too often when two people worked together, one would inadvertently kill the other <laughs> by dropping a tree on them or whatever. So it was common practice to uh, cut alone. So uh, I set up my little pup tent and uh, pulled out the chainsaw and put on the big uh, five-foot bar. And sure enough, the trees were enormous. <laughs> and I was to cut everything from 10 inches up. And I was to drop all of the trees parallel to each other. I was somewhat familiar with uh, chainsawing because my dad started a, uh, <clears throat> many different businesses to try to make ends meet. And one of them was cutting down all of the dead elm trees in Buffalo, New York. <laughs> they all died overnight. And uh, my job was to climb into the trees because they, they were five feet or 20 feet away from houses. So I'd, we'd spend a week, I'd climb into the trees and lower the branches. And, uh, and I'd go to another branch and another branch. And pretty soon there would be this 30 foot stump with no branches. And uh, one time to cut down that 30 foot stump in a 12 foot area between two <laughs> houses. And it was about two and a half, three feet in diameter. My father cut a big wedge in it, put a big cable up at the top and hooked it to the pickup truck. And he told me to use the chainsaw to make the final cut. So <clears throat> I was cutting away and he's pulling with a truck and the chainsaw of course stalled. And these things became known to me as don't works, don't starts. <laughs> Chainsaws find every reason imaginable to not work. So that aren't things stalled and the tree went like this and then it turned 90 degrees and cut the house in half. And we became general contractor <laughs> and uh, built a new house for this, uh, this family. So I had a lot of adventures with uh, chainsaws. So here I am in Idaho the first day and uh, I start cutting and by about two o'clock in the afternoon, I had cut maybe eight trees and I needed to cut over a hundred. It wasn't looking good. <laughs> And I was absolutely exhausted <clears throat> and I had the chainsaw in my hand and I was heading back towards my tent because I needed some water and I tripped and my saw hit my foot and cut the shoe <clears throat> right in half and it went flying off uh, 10-15 feet away 
and the pain of losing half my foot was absolutely excruciating, and I passed out. Woke up a little bit later, the chainsaw was sitting next to me going putt, 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 and I flicked the switch, turned it off, and I was in and out <clears throat> for the rest of the afternoon, but finally, around uh, 7, 8 o'clock, I <clears throat> was able to deal with life. My foot was still hurting like hell, and I'm looking down at it, and I notice that there's no blood. Incredible pain all the way up my body, cramps in my arm, but there was no blood. And I'm looking at it, and ever so slowly, five toes came out <laughs> of that shoe and half a foot. I had not scratched myself at all. Nothing had happened. <laughs> Apparently, I had been a, a runner. I ran a 431 mile, uh, the last one I ran in high school, and I was all muscle. And uh, apparently all my muscles just cramped up the second that chainsaw touched the shoe. <laughs> and <clears throat> my whole foot folded in half inside the shoe. It was uh, remarkable. I had a very good first lesson. Uh, I didn't have any other shoes but an old rotten pair of sneakers, and that's what I used for the, uh, the rest of the summer. So the first rule, of course, <clears throat> in chainsaws is don't have a long bar. <laughs> You should have a bar that, when the chainsaw is hanging down in your arms, doesn't reach your feet. <clears throat> a 16-inch bar will cut a 32-inch tree. So people always buy bars that are much longer than they need. Of course, in a commercial world, uh, it does turn out that you need <clears throat> longer bars. The second thing <clears throat> about uh, chainsawing, and I suppose that should be the first thing, is should you chainsaw to begin with? And <clears throat> my experience is that, of course, you should chainsaw because you are stronger than any chainsaw. Anybody who can pick up a chainsaw and start it <clears throat> is strong enough to push it into a tree and make the chain stop. These motors are not all that powerful. If you can't do that, you certainly shouldn't use a chainsaw. But the major cause of injury with chainsaws is inattention. <clears throat> it has to do with people not paying attention to what they're doing with the saw. They pick it up and start sawing and they're thinking about their girlfriend or the IRS or God only knows what. And the chainsaw is actually strong enough to throw itself eight or nine feet. But you can always make it not do that. So being safe with a chainsaw is a question of uh, <clears throat> choice. In America, safety is looked at in uh, one way, but people might look at safety in a different way. In America, it's all about everything being somebody else's fault. So over the years, we've become more and more socialistic, and we have this thing called OSHA that certainly claims that everything is somebody else's fault. So you rely <clears throat> on these uh, institutions to take care of you. So <clears throat> my employees have to follow OSHA rules. And so with chainsaws, it's a question of putting on Kevlar pants and steel toed shoes <clears throat> and helmets and goggles and all kinds of paraphernalia. And uh, by the time you get that stuff all on, <clears throat> it's time to uh, take it all off and go home. And there's not enough time to get anything done. I chainsaw totally differently. I wear sneakers and shorts and nothing else. No helmet, no goggles. All of these things hinder my natural ability to be safe. So I'm, I'm out there all excited and springy and alert and seeing all the branches that might fall and trees that are leaning on trees. I assess all of that stuff. And I'm 75 years old and I've never had a scratch <laughs> from chainsaws or from anything else. <clears throat> I'm uh, completely whole. And I strongly advocate that people start thinking of safety that way, of you being in charge of yourself instead of relying on some government agency to foresee everything that could possibly uh, happen. But, as I mentioned, the long bar was a, a, a problem. The other thing to consider is that chainsaws rotate in this direction. So if you put a chainsaw down onto a, a log, it pulls the chainsaw away from you. <clears throat> so it's very safe. If you put this part, the top of the chainsaw, under a log, <clears throat> it throws back toward you. So you need to, of course, know that. And I use chainsaws in every direction, overhead, underneath, no matter uh, what position is required by the positioning of the tree, the chainsaw will adapt to. But <clears throat> I'm fully aware of where it's going to get pushed, so I simply use muscle to counter that. The other thing to consider is that the <clears throat> if the chainsaw is really sharp and sawing, 
it will just smoothly go through the wood instead of kicking around. So having an extremely sharp saw is very important and having the trigger pulled all the way. These chainsaws are designed to either idle or roar. Anything in between is simply going to wear out the clutch and make the saw uh, dangerous because it will catch and throw itself uh, back at you. The other uh, forms of injury, if you are logging through the middle of a long log that happens to be supported here by a rock and over here by a branch or whatever, <clears throat> and you're in the middle, as you're sawing through it, eventually you're down enough that the log suddenly drops. And if you're using the tip <clears throat> of the chainsaw, to do that, when it drops, the tree pinches the chain and the saw could jump up suddenly. And this apparently was happening to people who weren't paying attention and the saw would jump up and go past their thumb and <clears throat> hit their face. Terrible injury. And there's absolutely no excuse for that. That is completely the user's fault. But America, it's not. It's the chainsaw's fault. <laughs> and those uh, sleazy people called lawyers I happen to be one of them. I love it when somebody gets injured that way. So chainsaws began to have things put into them to prevent that kind of thing. So we have here, <clears throat> this is my old chainsaw that I bought in 1962. Here's a chainsaw <clears throat> that is quite a bit more modern and it has this bar on it. So that when the chainsaw kicks up, <clears throat> it smashes your knuckle, but it does not hit your face. And that was the case for a while. <clears throat> then they proved it some more and they installed it so that it's hooked onto a spring that stops the chain from moving. So this is considered uh, de rigueur <clears throat> and everybody, every chainsaw has it nowadays. I find it to be a real pain in the neck because chainsaws are constantly need to be taken apart and <clears throat> repaired and fixed. So this is one more thing that has to be uh, uh, used. When my kids started to use chainsaws, uh, I was a little bit worried about <clears throat> the chainsaw kicking. They didn't have the muscles that I had. So <clears throat> I put a tip on the bar. So this means that you can't use the tip. So now the chainsaw can't kick. So they got used to the weight of the saw <clears throat> and the power of the saw. And I had them use it that way for a couple of weeks and uh, then removed it sort of like training wheels, I suppose, on a, on a bicycle. And I would recommend that for <clears throat> getting kids and maybe even adults started on chainsaws. The other form of injury are a little bit more subtle. We have all of these teeth here <clears throat> constantly hitting the tree. So that creates a certain vibration. The piston going back and forth in the engine has another vibration. So these two vibrations <clears throat> are constantly changing harmonics that have subtle effects on your uh, joints. So <clears throat> I get to college and uh, late September, early October, <clears throat> and my hands were like this. <laughs> my hands were so used to holding tightly to a chainsaw that they were just normally like that. <laughs> and I actually had to push my fingers open to be able to pick up a pencil. But I, somebody told me that <clears throat> what you had to do is simply exercise your joints. So I started doing this. And so for a month and a half or so every fall, I'd do this. And I could never get a date. People looked at me like I was totally nuts <laughs> or something was terribly wrong with me. But here I am, 35, and I don't have, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm just beginning to have slight arthritis, but the chainsaw in the end did not damage my uh, knuckles. But you should be aware that that vibration can do that. This chainsaw has the chain component <clears throat> and the motor all bolted together. So the vibration is immediately transmitted right to us. Modern chainsaws separate those. So here you can see that this motor here <clears throat> is separate from the two handles so that they're mounted on rubber donut mounts and the vibrations are considerably dampened. What I like about it being direct is that I can feel how the chainsaw is feeling today <laughs> or how it's feeling halfway through a log. And listening to the sound of the engine, the kind of uh, tone makes you adjust the pressures that you're putting on the chainsaw automatically so that it continue to work, it can continue to work uh, most efficiently. People who are not sensitive to that find themselves <clears throat> having the chainsaw catch in the wood and not cut. So they've got the motor roaring like mad <clears throat> and the chain's not moving. And it's because they didn't notice that <clears throat> it was beginning to be a little too hard on the chainsaw. You got into a 
a bit of hardwood, perhaps, or near a knot or something that relates very differently to the teeth <coughs> than when it's going through fat uh, cells <coughs> that are perpendicular to the saw. So becoming the chainsaw and thinking of it as your best friend or your pal and being sensitive to its own feelings makes the chainsaw <coughs> a real joy to use and makes it uh, far more effective. The uh, last thing <coughs> about safety, also subtle, is noise. So this chainsaw did not have a muffler. It had something called a spark arrester to prevent the force from catching fire. <coughs> so it's quite loud. But today, even modern chainsaws are way too loud for our hearing. I lost most of my hearing during those uh, four summers in Idaho. So when I'm in a group of people, I have no clue what they're saying. And so I've learned to deal with that. I just nod and say, wow, really? That's very interesting. And uh, <clears throat> I have no, no idea what it was all about. If I'm in a room with one person, I can, uh, I can hear. And that's really too bad. And uh, that should not have, uh, have happened. So it's very important <clears throat> that you always wear hearing protection. This is the one piece of safety equipment that I really feel uh, you should uh, consider. So these things cut out noise. Noise is measured in decibels, and uh, it's an exponential kind of curve. If you find one that takes off <clears throat> 30, 23 decibels, that's not bad. But if you find one that does 24, just one more, and it costs $12 more, it's worth it. <clears throat> so any one decibel more is an enormous cutback in the uh, uh, sound that is going to injure your ear. What is happening in your ear is that there are neurons connected to each other in our brain, and they're uh, creating electrical pulses that go from one to the other to the other, and they're chemically produced, sort of like a car battery. And uh, if you make it happen too often, too long, <clears throat> it loses its ability to do that. And uh, they're only just now beginning to think that they can change and fix that, but it hasn't happened yet. So wear the hearing protectors and you should be in good shape. Hey there, thank you for watching. Here at Shelter Institute in Woolwich, Maine, we teach a wide variety of house building and timber framing and carving classes. We'd love to see you here, but if you can't make it to Maine to take one of our classes, our online class is available at shelterinstitute.com.